going to call the meeting to order. Um, Mike, do we need to review Zoom procedures again? No, it's just us, so we're fine. Okay. All right. So I guess the first item is approval of the agenda. Everyone wants to take a minute to look at the agenda. If anyone wants to make a motion to approve the agenda, go ahead when you're ready. I'll move to approve the agenda. Great. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Okay. So the next item is comments from the chair. I don't have any comments. And then general business comments from the public. Do not see any members of the public here. So let's get to um, the discussion of the public input on the chapters that we've, um, the three chapters that we've had so far, the housing, arts, and historic resources. Um, I was just trying to reread the emails before we started. And um, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to, go about this, but <laughs> does anyone have any general comments on the, uh, or, you know, things that you picked up on the public input that we received? We received several emails from Peter Kelman, one from Nikki Howe, um, and we received the comment from uh, Joe Castellano and also the, the TIFF report, but I, that one was less specific to me too you know, actual items in the city plan. And the one from Joe, I thought was more general. Um, and I'm not sure where we have specific references to the TIF. I'd have to go back and look, but anyway. Yeah, it's, it's part of the housing it's, chapter. It's in the housing as oh, part okay. of the, the, the country club road development. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not just up on the... Oh, well, great. Maybe... maybe Okay. Do do we want to go through maybe just start at like arts and then so historic preservation and then get to housing where we know there's going to be a, there's more comments? Yeah, um, that sounds that sounds good. So, um, so the consistent one in the arts was that it was too much about the visual arts, not the performing arts, or uh, music falls under performing arts. Um, and then also a lot of emphasis on public art, which I think is because historically this came from like the public art commission, <laughs> committee, <laughs> something. So that kind of makes sense. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, do we just rethink all of the many of the goals, because most of the goals also seemingly are about public art, public visual arts. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if, how, how um, often does the, is it the Public Arts Commission or the Arts Commission? I'm not sure of the name. The how Public Art Commission. Oh, okay. But we also we also have uh, folks like Montpelier Alive who are also involved in public art and festivals and those types of you know art related events. Right. Yeah, because I feel like I'm not sure how to incorporate. I appreciate that it's all about visual arts, and it hadn't occurred to me. I'm not sure how to. I don't feel qualified to. I would like somebody with a <laughs> an arts group or a you know a, a, some artists or people who are more involved in the artist community to address that. I guess is my feeling. We can also lean on the fact that this is um, 
you know, it, it's a, it is a, a city plan and it recognizes what we, what we know and what we don't know. And we also can just go through and make reference to that, make a clear reference to that within the text and within the implementation chapter itself to go through and say, you know, it's recognized this plan only addresses these issues and doesn't address these other issues. I think there were, there were some comments I'd heard about, you know, it, it talks a lot about, you know, the chapter title is arts and culture, but it doesn't really talk much about culture. And maybe we need to be addressing culture more. Um, and we can somewhat leave the chapter as it is. If we don't have time and we don't want to hold up the process. We can just go through and say, this should be addressed, you know, in, in a future update of the city plan, this should be expanded to include these other areas. And that'll set some tasks for those committees to start moving forward on building out more information for the, for a future plan update. If we wanted to. Well, I'm also wondering if part of the issue that the, is at the intersection between what the city is doing and the arts is really only happening in that public art sphere. Um, like there's like the Lost Nation Theater, which I think gets a good, um, has like a good rental agreement with the city to be able to use a space, which is kind of the way a, the city is supporting the arts in that sense. But I, I wonder if the city really isn't doing anything outside of public arts to support arts and culture. And that's kind of what this is, this chapter is exposing right now. Like Mike, are, are there any other could programs I, that could I could I just could I even step back just a little bit even from there and just say, like, how do we make this a more of a living plan? Because if we have to have everything perfect, like we're never I mean, we've already been working on this for three years, right? And we're never going to get it perfect. And at the same time, the city is so different than when we started working on this, like, We've been through a flood, we've been through COVID, we have like hardly anybody walking in the downtown, right? And so, but it doesn't mean I think we should throw out the whole housing, everything that's been done already. I just think it's, you know, how do we make the whole thing something that, hey, we can continue to add to this. And, you know, I don't know, is that too burdensome for this, the city council to have to constantly approve edits or something? Or is there an ability to give um, some of these committees, you know, right authority. I mean, I, I just don't know. I'm just, cause I feel like there's so much that could be addressed, right? Like we all want, we want culture and arts. We want housing. <laughs> we want all these things. Uh, but the, the, the environment's changing on us. Right. And so how do we, how do we create something that's more flexible? Yeah. My, my hope is that this plan will start to operate in much the same way as our zoning regulations were. So we went from 2011 to 2018 without making any zoning amendments. Um, and now we make about one on average, about one a year. So we're coming back every year with another set of changes. Sometimes they're fixes, sometimes they're typos, sometimes they're just policy changes because things change and we're, we're trying to keep up with the times. I'm hoping that the city plan will be the same way that we really haven't had a major update in 10 years, but really what we should be doing is every year tackling another issue. Um, hopefully our committees are bringing stuff to us, to you to go through and say, you know, Hey, we just redid a new economic development strategic plan. And that would be a great time for the planning commission to sit down and say, Hey, let's, let's incorporate this in, then let's readopt the city plan and or readopt the chapter for the city plan to incorporate what we learned in that process. Um, but you guys don't have to do the EDSP. That's what somebody else is going to be doing. Or uh, if the arts commission does something more, the public art commission does something more, then we can come back and revisit it or the housing committee. Um, again, I think there's a lot that we can be tackling um, well, if that's if that's the model, maybe we can just make a reference. And I, I'm not saying Maria or whoever wants to comment that we can't dive into this, but maybe we should just put a statement saying we'd like to expand this in the future to include our more holistic approach to arts or something like that, right? So that we can continue to move forward, but we recognize that there's a lack 
anyway, that's that's just a thought, Mike. If we're going to have sort of annual, semi-annual updates, maybe that's a way that we can recognize the comments that have come in that are, you know, should be addressed, but we're not yet equipped to to give the answers. We just, we, we can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure. Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, we just have to make sure we we just build in a, it, it's, it has to be dynamic, it has to be more nimble. Um, because we we've had two floods and we're going to have others and it's going to, it's going to be ever changing, um, with, uh, the opinions and also, um, you know, stomachs, uh, for the future. Uh, so it just has to be nimble and dynamic. That's, that's all. Uh, very quickly. I, I just want to dovetail really quickly on what Gabe just said is I, I think it's a good sort of way to kind of kick off this discussion. Like, I view this as a, you know, it, it is a broad aspirational document that outlines the town's priorities and, and aspirations going forward. That being said, is I, I think we it's easy for us to get wrapped around the axle of perfection, and we don't want to make perfection the enemy of the good. Um, we put a lot of good work into this. Um, that's not to say we can't dive into these issues, but I, I do think that we ought to, as we move forward in this discussion, to sort of triage, like, what is the weight of some of these uh, sort of comments from the public and how much do we want to engage on them? Cause I agree with you, Gabe, like I can see us spending a lot of time just sort of spinning our wheels around this stuff. But um, this is sort of a long winded way to segue into a, a clarifying question I have is I remember the, the sort of public comments about the uh, visual art centric nature of the document. I, I can't remember what the actual sort of what the, I'll call it a critique, but what the critique was about, um the public nature of the arts chapter is it is the idea is that it, is that it's lacking um goals and aspirations to support private like sort of arts activity in the town and if that's the case like i guess there's just sort of a threshold question to me is like is that a priority of the town because i I feel like the arts, the public arts council, Montpelier Alive, those seem to me to be uh, focused more on what we would kind of call it capital P public art as opposed to private art. Like I, I take your point about like Lost Nation existing here and whatnot, but I mean, maybe it is like you said, Gabe is just make a make a quick reference to the fact that we do have you know a substantial sort of private art. <laughs> activity going on and, and the you know the town supports that through things like leasing out space in city hall and things like that but i, I don't know that we, there's any sort of unique goals and aspirations we need to tack on to what we have i think we have a fairly comprehensive approach to it but that's my two cents well i mean i think that is the issue is that we our aspirations are to support arts and culture in montpelier and of course that's part of a livable community. Like there's all this like wonderful language in the storyboard, but then when you look at the goals, it's only talking about like the visual public arts. And as I think two people said, like there's only so much canvas in the city <laughs> for public art. So you need to be able to support, you know, or encourage the support of private artists and private artists are leaving Montpelier. It's too expensive. You can't get studio space here. It's just, it's like not an easy place to be an artist. Um, so I think that's exactly what they're saying, that like, it can't just be public art. The city, if it really wants to encourage arts and culture to make Montpelier a well-rounded city, that public art isn't enough. Yeah, I guess I would follow up to just say, um, agreeing with Maria, there's, there are, a lot of uh, some other communities um, would probably lean heavily into uh, it's, you know, you get these buzzwords that come up every once in a while. And probably about 10 years ago, it was a big, the buzzword was, you know, the creative economy and, you know, communities that have a strong creative economy uh, generally are doing better. And, you know, um, this was especially like during the recessions in these parts, there, there were a lot of stuff that came up that, you know, it was the places that were, had the creative economies that were doing better. And so there was strength in trying to go and encourage and what could we do to, um, 
enable these small businesses, these creative uh, thinkers and creative people um, to succeed. And a lot of it needs the non-traditional, you know, it's not just office space, it's worker space. Um, And so there was kind of a, a lot of pieces around that that would say, okay, how do we have a successful creative economy? Um, you know, in our case in Montpelier, how could we have a more successful and vibrant creative economy? Um, and that comes down to studio space, worker space, um, and all the secondary impacts that that could bring. And the question I guess would be, um, so if the storyboard's good and we're just missing out on an implementation strategy, we just may go and make that comment, getting a little bit to Gabe's, a little bit to what I had mentioned earlier. We may just go and reflect the fact that, you know, here's here in our storyboard, we've talked about all these things, but our implementation strategy is lacking because it's lacking in these areas. Uh, this implementation strategy leans heavily on the public art master plan that was adopted in 2019, but that plan did not look at all of these other pieces that would be that would make Montpelier more successful, vibrant, you know, it, it helps contribute to those things that we talk about. You know, we want a vibrant downtown. Well, a vibrant downtown probably you'd expect is going to have something to do with the arts in, in a lot of different ways. So let's see what we can do um, to build out our plan to not just be public art, but to also be, these other things and we can go through them and work through them and tick them off, but we don't actually have to go and develop that plan. Now we just really have to reflect the fact that our implementation strategy isn't capturing everything that we would like it to. And moving forward, these are the areas we should be working on. And I think that kind of gets some of it. Um, I had a note from Pyvon from the, from the virtual meeting, uh, Pyvon, uh, we've mentioned most of her comments, but one she also mentioned was missing support for artists. And I think that goes a little bit to what I just mentioned with that support for the creative economy. There's, um, you know, if, if we want folks to succeed here, um, then we have to find ways to make it more affordable, um, for, for that to happen. And our, our current plan, our current city master plan that exists there was a lot of discussion of turning Barry street into kind of an arts, um, an arts area, but hasn't really worked out that way. hasn't really kind of fallen into that, but that was a, that was a discussion at that time. There also was in the existing plan, a lot more conversation about culture. Um, there was a lot more, there's, there's lists and descriptions of all the churches and all the different groups and all the different things and, and, we haven't really gotten into that in this plan. I don't know if we want to, but that, as I said, was just where other communities, other times, other places can explore things differently. Uh, Carlton, I saw you were trying to get in. I I just, I want to highlight what I really do appreciate uh, about the wording uh, with, within uh, the arts and culture. And that's the, uh, the tourism uh, in Montpelier depends on the beauty and the novelty of our uh, built environment, including public uh, art. Um, you know, I, it's, I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people. Um, you know, we need to also, I think we all realize actually uh, that uh, state workers aren't going to come back with the, uh, with the force that they're come uh, that they're, that they were um, before in the past. And so we need to start uh, kind of turning the ship towards uh um, tourism, uh, and that that's really a good part. Uh, another part I wanted to highlight is the fact that uh, it says the arts and culture plan relates with the transportation and utilities chapters uh, by enhancing uh, ordinary practical infrastructure um, uh, to make uh, its uh, con- uh, uh, contribute uh, to uh, to make it contribute to the aesthetics value of the city. Um, we we need to bring in more dollars other than uh, finding other ways to uh, you know raise the taxes. And uh, so that's a great piece right there as well. And so that's I just want to highlight those uh, great points. I guess maybe as to me, this is like sort of more like an overall process question, which I think is helpful is, is that 
is that how we can incorporate a lot of these specific, I mean, presuming we get more <laughs> specific public input uh, questions is to add something, you know, sort of in the preface or the, um, I'm not sure exactly what you call it, but the beginning section of each chapter that says we recognize, um, you know, that this doesn't address non-visual arts. We recognize that there's not a lot in this, the aspirations and goals to how do we support artists uh, living successfully or having studio space in the, in the town. Um, so just as a general process question, I, does everyone feel good about that as a way to kind of incorporate the public input? I think, I think that's point. reasonable. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sean. That's all right. Um, I was just gonna say that I think that's reasonable and that it kind of meshes with the fact that this is kind of needs to maintain its generality uh, and not get bogged down in too many specifics um, so that it can be kind of flexible uh, and recognize that it's constantly a work in progress. Yeah, I, I think it's fine that uh, I think what we're talking about here is like some kind of qualifying statement, like you're saying in the preface or in the pregame saying what we're, we recognize that this doesn't address every, this plan or these, these uh, doesn't deal with every issue having to do with art in Montpelier. But I, as I look through the arts and culture, the strat, the goals and the implementation stuff, there is, I mean, it does go beyond public art, but it looks like we started with what we know and started with and leverage the expertise we had on hand at the time. That, I mean, I don't know, I'm looking back. It seems to me that's what, Mike, that's what, and others that were on the com commission before, it seems like we kind of built on the expertise we already had. And not to say we couldn't, like we said, put in the qualifying statement. I think that's a good way to deal with it because there is a lot, we could add tons to this, but we'd be here forever. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's important to to me to put some of those specifics in the preface to the specific chapters, like these comments about art, because otherwise, otherwise, what is the public input for? <laughs> you know, like, why are we having public input sessions? So. Yeah, and I think the, that solution, I think works well for places where we're missing stuff, like what we're talking about right now, you know, we're, um, we've asked people, tell us what you think, what's right, what's wrong, what's missing. And in the case of what's missing, sometimes I think this is going to be our answer. I think in other times, public input is going to require us to sit down and make a decision. Um, you know, we've gotten some specific comments and, you know, maybe as we're picking through the Peter Kelman comments, you're, it's going to be a very specific, you should be talking about more than just resilience, you should be talking about X, in which case we'll have to make a decision. Do we change our goals to be this or that, or do we add this? So I think there, it, it's not always going to be something we can just solve by putting a preface in the storyboards. I think sometimes there will be an issue of we should be talking, you know, your, your goals don't talk about this word and we need to be talking about this word. Um, it's all, it's about, climate resilience it's not just about uh, yeah because i think that was his comment it talks about floods and we should be talking about more than just floods we should be talking about climate resilience well i think that's a that's a policy question we actually have to discuss and potentially make a change in the document too but i think in this case your solution i think is the right it's the right one either we have to stop and make the edits and update the plan or we have to just simply preface it and say you're right we recognize that and this is a deficiency that should be addressed in the next plan when it gets updated. Okay. So Maria, I'm wondering, would you be willing to like look at the arts preface or narrative and add something? Yeah. Just draft something to add that we could look at? That'd be great. Yep. Um, and I do have one other kind of overarching process question, which is if we're 
I mean, I, I totally agree that this is a, I'd love this to be a living document. It's a point in time. We should also maybe add some language at the beginning that really emphasizes that um, if we don't already have it, I can't remember. But I feel like, I don't know, there's a lot of things like at my workplace or my personal life. It's like, oh, I'm going to revisit this every year. And it doesn't happen unless there's like a... <laughs> you know, like an external force or a reminder. I mean, how are, can we incorporate that in some way to the city's process? I don't know. I'm just, I don't have a good idea for that, but like every October we, each committee is tasked with looking at the, at the chapter in the city plan and thinking about it or something like that. I think some of that will come out of, the planning department and planning commission every year. I mean, we should be sitting down where, we're, I mean, city council has gotten into the habit of it. Let's do a strategic plan every year. It's on their calendar and they work, start working on a strategic plan. And I think we should be thinking about that every year as well. Um, probably like the month after we finish getting one adopted, we'll be like, okay, we just wrapped up a revision to the energy into the transportation chapter, you know, what should we take a look at next? You know, what are the big issues that are going on now? What have we heard? You know, and that'll probably come back to me. What have we heard about that needs to be updated? Maybe as a result of state law, maybe as a result of um, just uh, input from city council and what we know. And we'll just pick some chapter and go through and say, okay, I think this is the year we should, spend, uh, you know, have an in-depth I think that'll be a real benefit too, because we can spend, you know, 10 months just working on an update to the transportation chapter, as opposed to trying to do 11 chapters and get 11 put on 11, we'll just be working on one and it'll get a lot easier for us to go through and say, all right, what are we missing? Let's be a little more nuanced now that we have some time, let's take some time and really think about it. And I think some chapters aren't going to change very much over time. Once we get them, if we get them right, they'll probably just roll on. I think about natural resources. Natural resources don't change a lot. They're, you know, if we've got a good plan for where the parks should be and where the greenways should be and how we should protect our water and how we should protect, it's probably not a chapter that'll change very often. Other chapters like the land use chapter and the housing chapter, I bet those will be ones that might come up more often over time. Um, and We'll just have to, like I said, just keep track of things. So it sounds um, like that should be then a standing agenda item for the planning commission after the plan is adopted. Like every month, just check in on, you know, what's what are we hearing about the city plan? What committees are working on what? Um, just as a way to keep it, keep it moving forward, because I am a little bit worried about if if we really want to make this a living document, just kind of losing it, then. Um, so yeah, and we can have an suggestion. annual. Yeah, we can have an annual. We should have an annual review of what's been done. I mean, again, we're trying to set this up to be an actionable plan, so we should be able to come through and say to everybody, "It's like, hey, remember we talked about we were going to go and update our growth center." Well, we put in that application last week, which we did. Uh, so we're renewing our growth center application, and that's going to have a request to expand the growth center into these new areas, which will, you know, isn't right now, but hopefully will be consistent with the with the new city plan when we adopt it. So those are the things we should be able to go through and check the boxes. You know, we put in the plan that we were going to do this. Guess what? We did it, um, which means, you know, and maybe when we hit a major milestone, stone. Now we're going to have to go back and revisit that plan because, you know, I think it'll be a couple of years down the road, but you know, if we've got housing being built in country club road, well, that's probably a significant time to start, go back and say a lot of our plan was based on getting this project to the point where we're building housing. Now we're building housing. Let's go back and see what else we could be doing now that, now that that is done, we should come back to the table and sit down and say, all right, now what? Um, did we solve our housing problem or do we need to do more in other places? Um, 
I was going to say on one, just in terms of being responsive to comments, there was that feedback about the list on the storyboard, the list of um, cultural, what are they called? The most notable cultural and artistic attractions. And there was feedback that we should have more there. I think that was Paivon and maybe in the virtual session, I can't remember. And other people have said, oh, there's, it only lists X, you know, and we have, there's a lot more, um, whether it be galleries or, you know, other cultural or artistic attractions in town. So I didn't know if we were inclined to add to that list that's currently on the storyboard. Yeah, I think that those are relatively quick things that we could do. If we had a list of, here are all the places that we missed, that is something the folks at SE Group can plug in in 10 minutes. Um, it, that's just a matter of dropping a dot and putting a name on it. Um, so yeah, if we've got more locations on the storyboard, we that would fill in. I can do that when I look at the storyboard. Just like okay. create a list of the studios in town and other art spaces. Great, thank you. Do we have any other comments on the arts chapter? Thoughts? Um, I don't believe we got any comments on the historic resources, to my knowledge. So I didn't get any, but I know histor the Historic Preservation Commission was going to be trying to take a look at it. So they'll probably get us some comments written at, at some point. But that one I always thought was in pretty good working shape. I sent them a couple of comments, SE group, a couple of comments. Uh, the Like the goals are wrong in it. It's just a matter of getting the correct goals written in because we go down and it has the implementation uh, aspirations and goals and then this aspiration summary but it doesn't have the doesn't have the correct goals i don't know where they pulled them from but it was wrong so we're going to get those updated and i think was let's see if i can grab was her Um, oh, we were going to add the National Register boundary um, on as a continual piece within the storyboards. I, I made that suggestion to them because as you look through the storyboards, the maps kind of shift and move as you're going, as you're scrolling through them. And I thought having a consistent, in that case, the historic register boundary, you can see these other images coming on and going off and you still have that same idea of, oh, okay, this is a smaller subset of the National Register and, oh, this is actually bigger than the National Register District. Um, it it kind of gives you at least some visual um, way of tracking those changes as opposed to trying to keep track of where the intersection of state and Maine is. Um, not everybody is kind of visually oriented to a map um, a map space. So it's a little bit easier if you kind of have a picture out there to, to track that all the way through. And I had a couple of those comments for some of the other storyboards as well that I wanted to see, you know, um, maybe like for economic development, we haven't done that one yet, but when we get there, like the growth center designation or the designated downtown should be in there. And as other things come in and go out, you at least know, oh, I know the designated downtown, it's right in this area, and I can visually follow the changes that are going through in the storyboard. Um, so those were the, the two changes that I asked them to make to the storyboard for historic. And I don't think we got any other comments, but that one had gotten a lot of input before, so... So then the last one, housing. Is there a way to um, screen share, Mike, your um, kind of the more 
you know, XD version of the housing housing chapter or the oh the the storyboard or the um, strategies. I guess whatever summarizes the aspirations, goals, and strategy. I find it hard. Just myself, I find it hard to like kind of toggle back since I feel like we're going to dive into this one a little bit more. If that's okay with folks. If if you can screen share something that whatever the best sort of visual is for the. Let me just jump to. Where is she? Updated storyboards. There we go. Make you bigger. There we go. All right. Okay. Let me close a couple of you guys down. So this was historic and this was housing. Thank you. I can zoom it out or I can zoom it in a little more if you want, but um, so these were the aspirations and goals. And I haven't finished going through. Um, I was trying as I had some time to, to go through and highlight where there was a specific comment. Um, you know, there's a lot of commentary and um, discussion of philosophies in Peter's comments, but trying to parse out where there's a specific recommendation for what we should be um, making a change. So we'll probably, we'll have to finish going through all those. Um, but again, I haven't can I can I uh, can I just ask, um, you know, I, I I just want to go on the record and say that I did appreciate Mr. Kelman's uh, emails. I did read them. Um, you know, I, I in the last meeting it, coming up to speed to like I've stated before uh, some of the legacy um, things that are going on that uh, can sometimes uh, not allow the uh, the communication to go forward. Uh, we should really address some of those things as well. Um, and so with that, um, Mike, you've mentioned, um, you know, Mr. Kelman a couple times as if this is something we're writing for him and it's not, uh, it's, it's for a larger group of people and, um, I appreciate him and I appreciate you, uh, but we should really keep our eye on the prize. And that's all I want to say. No, that's, and that is, um, that's fine. I've just mentioned to everybody that, you know, if people spend the time to write comments that, you know, um, I would review them, we would review them. Doesn't mean we'll make changes because of them. It just means that we'll recognize, yep. Yeah, um, you know, that's, that's a valid comment or that's not something that we're going to make. Um, um, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, one of the other comments that we received was from Joe Castellano about the, the use of TIFF. Um, you know, I would probably argue against um, the removal of TIFF because uh, I've used TIFFs before and they're, they're very powerful, very um, useful tools for getting stuff done. Um, they're complicated and takes a little bit to get your head around how they work and why they work. But, um, Doug Hoffer, who is the, um, 
state auditor really dislikes them. And, uh, he has taken to, um, you know, basically, um, take a real hard line approach on everything, um, regarding them. Uh, you know, state law, a lot of times can be gray. It can be read either as an A or a B. And so, you know, those of us who had TIFs, we'd work with the state to go through and say, we could read this as A or B. What do you think? Well, we'll go B. And then we would have the auditor come in and say, well, you should have done A. And it's like, well, look, we worked with the state. And so it was a very complicated process. And that's, that's where there is a large document that does have a lot of negative comments on TIF. I would argue it's a very valuable tool and we should be pursuing it because it's how these types of projects can move forward. Um, even though certain politicians really dislike them. Um, okay. You're still muted, Carlton. I just, um, I, I just want to want to add again, uh, Mr. Castellano, um, when we met, uh, at the, uh, the art gallery at Wilder, um, great conversation, great, um, contributor. Um, and again, the energy uh, of some of the things that may have been going on in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, 15 to 10, what have you, um, is what we need to go ahead and address and step over and, uh, collectively uh, so we can move forward on things. So it's not, um, you know, haunts of individuals that are influencing, um, you know, references. And that's all I'll say about, again, um, that, that. I, I would say about the, the TIF that I do think we should keep it in there. Um, it is a tool that, you know, should be available to the city. Uh, you know, just having the language in here isn't going to mean that we are beholden to doing it. My memory from living in Burlington uh, prior to the pit uh, and that TIF district that um, that there was still that before that actually went forward, there's you know, the city council had to make that call, right? That they had to decide whether they would grant that uh, to the developer uh, so, you know, us having it in here doesn't guarantee that we will, uh, use it, but we should keep it in there to keep it as an option. Especially as a, it's, it's a, a public suggestion. And then that, he... I also, I read through the auditor's report on TIFF. Um, so I think the, uh, Joe mentioned that there's a potential for increase in housing or an increase in property taxes, which is like a hot button issue right now. But I was very confused <laughs> from the auditor's report because it seemed as if, I mean, it seems as though they found that property taxes increased like literally by pennies. Um, and so I had to go back and forth between his email and the report because Yes, there was an increase, but I don't, this is not at all, you know, what we are talking about when we talk about property taxes increasing, it's not an increase of pennies, you know? Um, so, I mean, I didn't find anything that remarkable in the auditor's report that would make us want to take away the TIF. I just echo those same comments that have already, you know, been thrown out there in terms of leaving as a tool, you know, if you think of, Country Club Road, I mean, that will require, it's going to require a TIF, right? The city's going to have to vote. And then if there's bonding, this, the people will vote. And so there'll be lots of opportunities for people to argue the pros and cons of whether we want to move forward in expensive projects or not. You know, what's the, the cost benefit of that? And uh, But to leave it as an option, I think, is important. So yeah, I think big picture, this is what some of these comments would be. We get a public comment, we review it. Now the public has been heard. They've given us a comment, we've reviewed it. We've decided not to make a change. I mean, I'm just reading the tea leaves of how many, what everybody's comments are. And I think that's how a lot of these comments will go through is 
a number of them are going to be ones that's like, um, you know, we appreciate the comment. That's a good comment, but we're, we're not going to make a change at this time because, you know, we we're sticking with our original plan and, and that's fine too. Just because somebody makes a comment doesn't mean we have to make a change. And I think this is how we'll go through most of the comments over the next six months is, um, that was a great comment. We appreciate the fact that they brought this to our attention. We've talked about it. We've decided, you know, the, the pros outweigh the cons and we're going to leave it as it is because it's something that can be addressed at a later time if it needs to be. Um, If the, if the public understands that what we're doing is uh, it's like a river and there's a whole bunch of logs going down the river and we're picking them up and we're looking at them and we're saying, okay, this could be important or it is important. We should put it. And so it goes down the river more and we're, we're kind of just, and, and ultimately calling balls and strikes and as best we can, um, you know, that's, that's what it is. But it, like, like I said, it, as long as it's moving forward, to build something is the goal. Yeah. That's, that's a good, good analogy, Carlton. I mean, that's, but you know, at the same time, we want to be able to communicate to the public. We are, we are listening to you. We're not just going to these meetings, taking public input and not changing anything or not talking about what your suggestions are. Uh, we are talking about them. Sometimes we make changes, sometimes small changes, sometimes big changes. Sometimes we don't make any changes at all. And I think as long as we keep explaining that to the public, that, we we do want your input and we will consider those changes. Um, and I think that's what we'll have to do. Um, and as I said, ultimately, I haven't highlighted through every single one of Peter's, be and I just mentioned him because he's given us a lot of information to review. And I want to be able to say at the end, I reviewed your comments, we reviewed your comments, and we made these changes we didn't make these changes and that's just the nature of public input. We're, we, we have 8,000 customers and um, so we're going to have to make the changes that we feel best represents the public as a whole. And that's, that's your job, not my job. Um, I don't, I, I make recommendations. I don't have to make the decisions that uh, you guys have the hard job. Um, so I didn't know if yeah. anyone else oh. went through. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I feel like I read Peter's comments pretty thoroughly on the overall, his overall sort of process critique and suggestions, but I did not read, get a chance to really dive into the specific housing um, comments so i don't know if we want to try and go through them here because you said mike you hadn't quite gotten through them either so i they're hate great. to postpone it but they're, they're great but <laughs> <laughs> yeah the process um, i must have grabbed the same ones you did or well, i i got through a bunch of the process ones most of which were you know i don't i don't think we should abandon the storyboards to go to a print version in order to make it easier for the public i think but that, that would be my opinion. I mean, so he had process questions. Here's a better way of doing it. Here's the way you should be doing it. Um, I'm not entirely convinced. I've done a lot. I've been doing this for 25 years. And generally, I think it's always hard to get input from people, um, especially early in a plan process, um, unless you've got a good hot button issue. You've got a good issue. If you've got Country Club Road, you can get people out. Um, if you want to do a significant rezoning on something controversial, you'll get people to come out. But in general, um, there's sometimes no news is, is good news. Um, you know, if we're moving along and we're not getting a lot of people upset and riled up probably means we're not, you know, um, we'd have to, we'd have to change something to make it more controversial to get more people to come out. So I tend to think having less um, people who are beating down our doors probably means we're not as far off from what the public thinks. Um, that's not to say we need to not try to do more okay, or I'm do not better. I'm sure I totally agree with you. <laughs> we, oh. we don't need to get into a deep discussion about 
the nature of, I mean, I just think this whole process is, and I think there was a comment from uh, Christine, I forget her last name. I, I think the whole process is a little bit overwhelming. I do agree that if there were a hot button issue in one of the chapters that would motivate people, certainly they would come out, but I'm not sure that we're not getting public input because we're represent, we're truly representing what, the city of 8,000 thinks. I think <laughs> it's it's a very complicated process and, and people aren't sure how to engage with it. But anyway, that's just my opinion. But um, I do think, you know, Peter and also I think this woman do find, I mean, I, I agree, I don't want to abandon the storyboards and the online process. Um, and I think of it kind of as like, you know, almost like a pilot, like we're going to try this for the city plan and see how it works. But I do think that it's important to have some sort of, um, and I think you said that we do have some, is there a sort of an alternative available or printouts available for people who find the online interface hard to navigate? We're getting, we've gotten these, the storyboards, uh, um, they're going to be, they're now PDFs. So they're easy to find the storyboards themselves. We, we haven't gotten them um, to be printable. And so we're going to have to work with our consultant to see how easy it would be or hard it would be to break it into pieces where it might be able to be PDF into some type of document that can be downloaded and printed. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, per uh, whoever, Printed out those booklets that we had from Montpelier are, are for everything that we did for the year. It, it, would that would would they be available? Do we have like a municipality side of printing that could just just make hard copies of these for, available on the tables in City Hall or other places like uh, the catalogs were? Uh, yeah, I mean, we could look for um, printing. It depends. Some of these we can print out pretty easily. Um, we are going to be printing these out and trying to put them up as posters in city hall. So that way they're available, um, in that way. Um, but just, yeah, we can, we can print like, them out. It just yeah. seems like sometimes when it, it depends on the audience, um, things are either online or then easily accessible in paper. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, which audience are we trying to reach? Uh, and if so, um, you know, how, can we use both? Uh, yeah, if we can get them converted with, then we would probably, we could, we would always offer them as both if we can get them printed. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Yeah. It just seems to me that, you know, the storyboards are reaching a certain group, but you know, what's on the screen right now is where the rubber meets the road. And if you really want to have something that you can print out and hold in your hand and review, then right what we're looking at now, aspirations, goals, and and implementation strategies are the thing. And this is has a a PDFable uh format. So in the best of both worlds kind of. Yeah, and we'll keep. I'll keep working to see if we can get the other one to be printed out. It won't fully capture everything that is in the the online, but at least it could capture the the text portions of those. Um, because the the advantage of the the web is your ability to link between pieces, and and that won't exist obviously with the paper copies, but. Uh, it doesn't exist with the with the storyboards, but it's information that people can um, you know see for themselves. It doesn't the dynamics of it. That's just that's vendor. That's just vendor dynamics and talk about the wow factor of what's going on within it. But that it, it that doesn't matter. We they just people just want the you know the the facts. Um, the bells and whistles are not that. That's just extra. So there was a comment from Nikki Howie saying that 
the neighborhood development area program should be a higher priority. If whoever is controlling the computer, can we scroll down and see what the current priority is? I will guess it's on the second page if it's lower. Mm, there it is. Looks like it has. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, it looks like it's got a couple of these that maybe this is an older one. There's a higher priority on the second page, should be on the first page. I'll have to go and see mm -hmm. about that one. But um, so, yeah, and so the neighborhood development area, the NDA, uh, it's a good suggestion that maybe it should be moved up. The, the reality is most of what would be an NDA is actually going to be in our growth center. So growth center has more benefits than the NDA. Okay. So we may actually be kind of not ending up with an NDA because we end up with a big growth center that covers it. Okay. But that's kind of a wonky detail that no, that's helpful we can know. figure out. And then um, we also got a comment at the at last the last meeting about how there isn't references to emergency housing. Does Montpelier have an emergency housing program? Um, like, do they rent out spaces or um, rent spaces through affiliates? Like, what is how does emergency housing work in the city? Uh, it has been a moving target so far, and that's been part of the goal is to come up with a fixed location. So I've been here 10 years. The emergency shelter has been run by different churches. Uh, I know it was in, I think it was in Bethany Church for a couple of years. I think it was in another church for another couple of years. The issue being uh, none of them met any of the fire and safety codes. And so that was always a big concern. We'd get waivers from the state and they'd say, this is the last time we're going to do this. And then we, we would come back the next winter and say, well, we don't have a location. Um, we don't need any waivers up at Country Club Road. So that's one of the reasons my sense is that that's going to more or less, you know, again, not a decision maker not on the council. Um, it's going to probably end up being used Again, even though it's not close to the downtown and we have to bus people in and bus people back out during the day, the building itself meets all health and safety codes. So my sense is it's going to probably continue to be used until we can finish up with probably what happens in the Barry Rec Center building um, where, there, where there's a plan to renovate and have some space in the basement area of that building. But that's a lot of money and a lot of investment to make that pro move that project forward. But we have a lot of grant and a lot of money coming in. So it looks like that project will move forward, but it's probably, let's see, if we're in 24, I would say optimistically winter of 25 to 26 would probably be when that opens. And I know there's also a conversation of not just having a winter shelter, but having a shelter that actually is a fixed location and works for a long time um, year round, as opposed to just in the winter. And the goal of that building was also to eventually maybe renovate some space on the second floor. So big picture for people who don't have all the pieces of the puzzle, um, the reason they wanted to make a new rec facility out at Country Club Road was so that way they could convert that building into um, the homeless shelter, basically, with a um, service hub on the second floor and then maybe additional housing on the third floor or some housing on the second and all housing on the third, but with having a service hub. And the service hub was meant to provide people who are homeless or almost homeless or, you know, uh, in need of assistance that there'd be a location where you could go to get help. It's not something the city would run, but the city would provide the building and then 
provide space for, say, a Good Samaritan Haven to invite in service providers. So, um, you know, maybe on Monday it's a health clinic and maybe on Tuesday there's employment assistance or maybe Wednesday there's and so they would be able to bring and use that space to provide services to people who who wanted it and were trying to move out of homelessness. How can I get the help to move out of homelessness? We'll bring the services to you as opposed to giving you a bus pass and telling you you've got to go to Barry City if you want to talk to somebody about employment or you need to go to Waterbury to talk to somebody about housing. We're going to bring those people to you. And that was that's the idea in the vision that they've had for that, that space, um, whether that becomes a reality, we're still working on it, but that's always been kind of the vision, but now we're kind of stuck as to is country club road going to actually work for a recreation facility? That question hasn't been definitively answered yet. And they're working on that this summer, um, with a strategic plan for the, the country club road had about 10 acres set aside for a community center and for recreation. Now they're going to do the plan. What does that mean? What are we going to try to build out there? Um, so big picture for anyone doesn't have all the pieces. That's how, and what we've been talking about, but uh, I think Rick was right. We haven't located and we didn't really reference our emergency housing because we really haven't had a location, but we could certainly go through now and tag a couple of those a uh, couple of those places that we do know about. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like the work is being done, you know, and so where does this, where is that work reflected in the city plan? And it, should it be under housing or services or both? Um, but I think it makes sense to reference at least the emergency housing component somewhere in this chapter. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's like goal six, you know, or our goals, our goals went away. Okay, here we are. Um, I think goal, it falls most easily under goal number six. Yeah, I forget when I move my screen that it takes you guys off of the share screen. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to find, I had a list somewhere. Somebody had that were like, these were the, the, the housing things. And one was um, uh, Rick had a, you know, Rick had that comment on, on missing, um, yeah, six goal six to increase support for partners, but Rick had the comment on there, but there was also a comment that on some of the, the tabs of the storyboard itself that we were missing, um, like not all the condos were listed and there was that list of other residential that really wasn't clearly articulated and really didn't attach to much. So I've I have an email. We're going to try to work on that. It looks like the database they were pulling from wasn't, I was thinking they would be pulling from the grand list, the, you know, the, the assessors list and they didn't, they were pulling from a different list. So we're going to try to get some better data in there for where are the accessory dwelling units, where are the, um, uh, group homes, where are the, all those different things that didn't seem to quite match up, uh, especially condos. It seemed to have this box for condos. You could click on condos, but it really didn't show all the condominiums that existed. But does it make sense to have another implementation goal that discusses the work that you are already doing to support emergency housing? It seems like it's something that the planning department is actively working on, but it's not reflected so far. Yeah, I think it needs a strategy. I think that that plan for, remember how we talk about, um, oh, there's a typo. Um, we have those five Ps and one of them is a project. I think we could have a project implementation strategy in here for the rec building and that's what's missing and that would help explain what i just explained to you guys this this is our vision for this building um it requires us to find another place for recreation 
And that's what's been holding up that process a little bit. We, we can't make this into homeless services until we find another location for our recreation programs. And what is, where do those, where do they go? Where can we move them to? So I'll put a note for need. Rec center project emergency housing. What did, I mean, I'll change topics a little bit unless people um, want. Uh, um, Rick made a, a suggestion, an interesting suggestion about um, maybe making housing a larger kind of an um, umbrella topic that we would kind of elevate. It's not just another chapter. It is the chapter that kind of gets elevated above all the others. Um, and we talked a little bit about that. I think, Brian, you might not have been there for that conversation. Um, so Rick DeAngelis, who's a uh, Good Samaritan Haven director, uh, he made a suggestion that housing really is kind of that that chapter that touches everything else, um, economic development, uh, um, you know, all community services, it just touches on everything. Housing affects everything. And we should elevate that um, rather than just having 11 different chapters all the same, that we should kind of call this one out as a bigger chapter. Um, and then maybe that I mentioned that maybe that would then change the, the synergies part. We currently have a synergies that talks about five of the other chapters Well, we actually could expand that and talk about how housing affects all 10 of the other chapters. Um, and that was just a suggestion that we floated that we could um, maybe change. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. I, I just want to piggyback on that and uh, bring up that in that last meeting at the country club that we had, Maria had a great suggestion uh, that, you know, like we're running into this now uh, with the arts and culture, we're running into it with the house. It, nothing really um, happens without um, equitable housing and, you know, affordable housing uh, within Montpelier. Uh, so it's, it's more like doing this after we do this in everything that we do so that we, again, um, focus on the, the true need um, before we highlight some of the things that people really want, because the workforce can't live here to give the people who want it, um, you know, that experience. Hi, can you, I'm sorry, can you, what was your suggestion for something we could add to? Just every, it wasn't my suggestion. It was, it was, okay. uh, it was Maria's suggestion when we were up at the country club to um, each chapter uh, focus on housing uh, because that's the, uh, the, the main uh, issue within Montpelier uh, before we do anything in, in all the other 11 chapters or each chapter focus on the one uh, priority um as a way of saying, you know, how does this affect uh, the housing? Uh, because if we don't have artists that live here, we don't have artists that can play here or make uh, art here. So putting something in, I guess that would really be the kind of Maria, the intro section. Maria, oh. Maria can yeah. do it. Oh, you, you too. <laughs> well, I just wanted to clarify. So I think, um, I think Rick's idea was that when decisions are made by city council, that housing is given, you know, if the, even if the decision has to do with like natural resources, that it should be part of their discussion of how this will affect housing. And so even, so if they are looking at something about, um, you know, energy, like, 
uh, how to make homes more energy efficient, that as they discuss that, they are also considering how this is going to affect future housing um, or housing costs. And I mentioned that in, I used to work in federal regulations. So whenever we, um, whenever people in federal government have, write a new federal regulation, they have to specify how it's going to affect small businesses explicitly. Um, so this, and this is even, you know, like it's entirely, if you think it's entirely unrelated, like, you know, fuel, fuel economy standards, but there is still like a little tentacle that touches small businesses because obviously small businesses are one of the consumers of vehicles. Um, and so I think the idea is that you might think that you are, I'm, since the sprinkler program is right here on screen, that if you are requiring sprinklers in, you know, commercial buildings or residential buildings, that it sounds great. Like this is a great thing. We all want sprinklers. We all want safety. But what is the effect on future housing? Is it going to make it so prohibitively expensive that we won't actually build any new housing? Um, and so I think Rick has a very good point that when decisions like this are made, I think there should be an eye to how this will affect the development of future housing. Um, you know, if a new historic district is identified, how is this going to affect the development of future housing? If new, I don't, I mean, if new transportation, new roads are built, how is this going to affect future housing? Like everything comes back to how is it, everything affects the de development of future housing. Um, so I'm not sure how we incorporate that into the housing chapter <laughs> because this is kind of like a more of like an overarching way that, you know, the city operates as opposed to just like part of the city plan. Um, it's a different way of decision making, I think. I think that's what he was trying to get at, but I don't know how this becomes part of a city plan. Yeah, I think that the way it would fit into this format here, the the strategies. Um, so um, again, the five P's, one of them is policy. So the policy P is how we spend our money, how we use our resources within city government. How do we use my time? How do we spend our tax dollars? So one of the things that could be in here is um, a housing policy about um, having those impacts. So every time we as staff uh, put together something that goes to city council, we have to fill out a, a staff recommendation form and it has required boxes. So if the city council passed a policy, we could actually have to go in on every single time we send something to city council and say, how, how will this impact housing? Um, it may have a positive impact. It may have no impact. It may have a negative impact. It may have an unknown impact, um, but it forces you to, start to put that in writing to go through and say, okay, um, you know, we're going to be amending the building codes in this way. What do we think the impacts are going to be? Well, it'll probably help it in this way and it may hurt it in this way, but at least you're making an informed decision of what impact it might have. And then city council has that information in front of them when they're make, when they're thinking about it, it's already been articulated by staff. Here's what we think. Sometimes it may have no impact. We're going to change the speed limits from 35 to 30 miles an hour on this road. Impacts on housing, none. Um, or maybe somebody can come up with something creative and say, well, it might have an impact. Um, but other things, as we said, our tax policy, our zoning, how we change our zoning regulations, how we... Um, so is that is that a city plan issue or is this a statute? Or something that we, you know, city code that we should be recommending. I mean, it seems to me like it's it's something regulatory, not planning. It's it's not really yeah, yeah, it's not really regulatory. It kind of it and it does fall into the plan. So we do try within the city plan to capture things we are doing already and new things. So in the plan right now, that would be a new policy. And if we implemented it, we would just, in the future, it would just stay on there as a continuing policy that every time we have these decisions, we have a we have this 
on our, uh, or that's probably how we would implement it is we would insert that into the language of all of our cover sheets and in our budgets, we would have to then discuss within the budget, what are the budget implications of um, the proposal that city council has put together. And those can be very direct and those can be very indirect. I mean, we, okay. So, so I guess maybe I'm not, maybe it should be in the plan, but there's also an additional step that would need to happen to say, look, this is actually the city policy, right? Yeah. We so would actually have to maybe, adopt the policy. Yeah. Yeah. We could just, we can put it in there as a strategy, correct? Yeah. I would put it in as a policy recommendation, a recommend to adopt the new policy. And then we'd have to come up with some language to describe what Maria mentioned. And really, this is what we want to do. And we want to force staff to make these decisions. So that way, housing impacts are at the top of everybody's list. And city council may eventually vote no on adopting that policy. And that's that's perfectly fine. We're putting together our planning commission plan for what how we think we're going to best achieve our housing goals. And city council will eventually adopt the plan and they may have not end up adopting all the pieces in it. They may, you know, eventually choose not to adopt that policy. But the idea is here, you guys have asked us uh, we what we as the city are going to do to make our goal. Here's our goal for housing. How are we going to get there? These are the 15 things we're going to do. Um, okay, so and it, this policy would be one of them. Okay. So would somebody be able to draft a strategy that we could consider to put for putting in here? Um, is that Mike? Is that somebody you? in Mike's department? I can, yeah, I mean, I can take a stab at it and then we can vote to um, see if I've captured kind of what, okay. you know, so captured sounds, the spirit of it. And if, if not, then at least there's something there and we can, you know, wordsmith okay. it. Well, it sounds like we have potentially two other strategies that you'll try to draft and we can look at it. Um, so okay, I just I wonder a, if- I have a oh, question and when, when it's the right time, Ariane, I've pardon. got- yeah. I've got a question. Well, I've really got a comment and then a question, but go ahead and do what you're doing. No, no. I was just trying to like move us on to the next thing. So you go ahead, Gabe. Okay. So, so my comment, like I am all about housing. And if you had asked me before July of last year, I would have said, yeah, number one, number one issue. And I'm, I'm, it's certainly a top issue, but I feel like the resiliency of our downtown is has got to be the top issue. I mean, I feel like this is just my opinion. I feel like the state is incredibly derelict with what their plans are for the downtown. And we've got a lot of things we need to figure out. So that's the comment. And I guess the question is just to Mike, are you know, I know there's like a, a resiliency working group. Is is any of their work gonna end up in in this plan, is that like an, a new chapter that might be added or what are the thoughts along that line? Yeah, good question. Um, because everything we, because we had everything ready to go last June <laughs> before the flood, really a lot of what we have in front of us doesn't reflect very much of what happened since the flood. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we already had been talking about. Hey, this is how we can be more resilient. This is how we can be more flood resilient. But we really haven't gone through to kind of put more into it. My thought is, as much as I don't want to kind of jump in there and do that now, um, resilience is such a big topic that it might eventually deserve its own chapter uh, and need its own chapter. That's kind of my sense of where things are going but i think we can talk about that we're at this point we have 11 chapters and if we decided in the summer let's have a resilience chapter i would probably work to try to put something together so we could do a quick review of that so when because we haven't done land use so when we go to do our last three chapters last group of three originally it was going to be a group of two I would just have that third one. We would put that one together and plug that one in if that's where we wanted to go. Um, Thanks, Mike. I, yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead. 
I was just gonna say, I don't mean to short circuit all this or kind of steer us in a different direction, but uh, I think if everybody on the commission, Mike, Ariane, and I, I think are the only ones that worked on or were around at the kind of inception of this project. And I just remember the first couple of years, like pre pandemic and even the early part of the pandemic, we sort of viewed this as that there was sort of a primary sort of three-legged stool, I would say, with uh, emphasis on housing, economic development, and transportation. Um, and I still feel like that's kind of a, I agreed to sort of elevate housing as a primary concern, but I do think that uh, certainly economic development, I think resiliency can dovetail in a lot of ways into the economic development piece. Um, and I think transportation hasn't gotten a lot of discussion from this group for a while, but I still think that that's also a, a very sort of there's some primacy to that issue as well um so i think the early discussions that we had we, we we talked a lot about you know ensuring that a people had housing b how do we develop the downtown so that you know how do we encourage economic development to encourage more people to come to town but then there was this issue lurking in the background of like how do we get people into town you know how do we how do these people function without a, a car and i think that's sort of been lost in and obviously the resiliency piece, the housing piece, but I think it's one that we, we ought to be cognizant of. So I'm all in favor of elevating uh, housing, but I think we should take a good hard look to see if economic development in some ways, the resiliency piece I think feeds into that. And also transportation as being sort of the, the three primary issues that we elevate and sort of coalesce or have the other chapters sort of coalesce around. And I, I understand that creates a certain amount of complexity um, but I think as an opening sort of presentation as part of this plan, that's, I think, a, a good way to at least consider doing it that way. Hey, Mike, um, let me ask you also, as far as the, like, the, you know, over on, if you could scroll over just a little bit where that .org boot camp is, are these going to, are these clickable? Uh, no, no, you don't have to scroll up, uh, scroll, you go, go down again. And then scroll over uh, to oh. the um, bootcamp.org or was that incrementaldevelopment.org to your left. Oh, hard. Oh, housing marketing outreach program there. Sure, but we can't see it like you do. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. I can I can see it like you do. Never mind. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Housing marketing outreach. The yeah. The the so house, these, getting housing are, developers in. Yep. Are, so are the are the mentioned dot uh, dot orgs or or uh, domains going to be clickable? Yeah. These should be live. Uh, and on the online ones, they are live. I think when she PDF them, they lost their. Well, well, let's see. Let's see what happens if I click on it. Ah, it is live. It just wasn't. We just should color that better. I'll I'll point that out to her to make sure that she. Um, updates that these should be blue so that way people recognize them as hyperlinks. Right. I was going, I'm sorry, Ariana, were you going to say something? Oh, <laughs> I was going to say um, on the topic of resiliency and climate change, um, I looked through other cities' city plans to see what they did because I think this is something that we're going to keep hearing about as we have these meetings, everyone. And I think there's this, um, I think it's also like the tone of the people giving these comments. They, it's almost as if like this whole entire city plan should just be dismissed because if we're not going to talk about, you know, future flooding and then what's the point of anything. So it's like, it's a very, uh, it's, I, I feel like it's very harsh. Like the comments we're getting about it are, are harsh. And I think it's like pent up order... anger. What's that? <laughs> he said what pent up anger. It? Yes. I said um... pent up. It's pent up anger of, of like 20, 30 years of like, we're like, hold on a second. It's a log going down. And they're like, no, it's a waterfall. <laughs> it's a waterfall. It's happening. Um, so I think just adding a chapter just so we can say like, oh, and here is our resiliency and climate change chapter it's it's coming you know as a way to keep the conversation moving along because right now it seems like it's a blockade as soon as people realize that this isn't about future flooding um that being said 
I did see, you know, large cities are contending with climate change because they are actually planning on flooding. Like they're on, <laughs> they're located on the Atlantic or the Pacific and they're kind of like watching the water moving up. Um, and I've been wondering whether like UVM has, has put out similar studies of uh, the different watersheds in Vermont, something that we can like lean on saying, this is what is projected to happen. Um, this is what the, um, you know, in 20 years, this is what will be the flood line for Montpelier. Um, so at least it looks like that we know, like we all know what is likely to happen. Um, we don't current, we're not currently building anything to prevent it, but if it's in our sights, you know, uh, cause I think again, like going back, just like the emergency housing, this is work that is being done somewhere. And we should have a chapter just reflecting that. Yes, we know, we know the flood risk is getting is high and getting higher period, <laughs> you know, yeah. because right now we don't have, you know, we don't have billions of dollars to do massive infrastructure projects, but just to be able to point to a chapter and to say, yes, we know, and this is what we're looking at. Well, and yeah. it does, it does probably dovetail into some of the economic development part too, because I don't know the actual number of state employees coming into the city, but it's, if it were 6,000, you know, in 2019, it's probably, you know, 1,500 today, right? And they're probably not coming back. So, I mean, I think all of those things, again, when we started working on this, those data points didn't exist, but we have them now. And there is, I know there's a committee somewhere talking about all these things, and they probably could get a heads up that, hey, we're probably going to come look to you later in the year to ask for some input, you know, and, and maybe it's going to be something like, you know, like we talked about with the arts where, hey, we, we're working at, there's a lot of things in progress, um, but this is the placeholder and here's what we know now. And, and it, it's incredibly important that we focus in on it, but more will follow. Yeah, I don't think we'll have a fully built out plan of what's going to happen for the implementation plan. A lot of it is, here's where all the studies are and of here's all the information we need to know before we can make those. Um, I mean, we, unlike the, the, the coastal communities have to deal with sea level rise, you know, there's not, you know, Vermont doesn't have to deal with that. Even, even Lake Champlain isn't going to be subject to sea level rise. So, but what we will have are changes to the climate, the amount of rain that falls, the amount, the, the intensity of storms, which is a little harder to guesstimate. I think that's what the weather service and others are trying to build into the new flood maps. Um, but yes, we do. We, we are, we required people to build two feet above the, um, what's what we call the hundred year flood plain, the 1% chance annual chance event. Um, but we're building two feet above that, which is a foot above, you know, if you were looking at things, uh, elevation wise, you got the hundred year flood plain, the five hundred year, the 02 percent chance is usually a foot above that for Montpelier. Depends on where you are in the city, the state, the country. But usually it's about a foot higher in Montpelier. So we're actually a foot higher than that. So we're really trying to, you know, it's not gonna mean it won't happen or never happen, but we've really kind of set ourselves up in a place where we think that's the that's that's the balance between cost and safety. Uh, we could make everybody be three feet above, but that's extra money um, and makes it that much harder to develop. So we're, we, we've made a decision that's where the balancing point is going to be. Um, but we having a chapter would give us the opportunity to have those explanations. These are all the things we are already doing, but obviously it's not enough. Um, and certainly, as Gabe points out, resilience and climate affects everything, including economic development. Um that one flood, I, I've heard various numbers. I'd love to see a final number come out um, on the economic impacts. Just for Montpelier, I've heard numbers between um, 60 to $90 million were the losses. Now, there were some insurance, but a lot of those were just hits that businesses took. Um, and that's 
um, you know, you, you can't suffer that too many times before you're going to not have a vacant downtown. You know, there are communities that have had hundred year floods happen three times in a row, um, you know, three times in 10 years. And I don't know how we'd survive if we got that. That's why we're pushing so hard. We need answers. We need solutions and we need to start flood proofing these buildings. So that way, you know, the next time it's not $60 million of damage. We're probably still going to get damaged, but we can recover from $10 million in damage, but we're not going to, we can't take, keep taking hundred million dollar hits and expect our downtown to keep bouncing back. Um, that's, that's really asking too much. We need to be more resilient and it is going to be a key piece, but as Aaron points out, so is, so is transportation, all the stuff we talk about. Transportation is your day-to-day stuff. Um, resilience is that thing that hits you once every 15 years, 20 years, hopefully every hundred years, not, you know, not that often, but transportation, transportation is every day. Um, so FEMA, and we'll get to that FEMA, chapter next. Uh, so, so FEMA, FEMA is uh, saying that they're going to run out of money uh, by August um, at this point. And um, it, it, it really, we, we really need to focus on it not being resilient. So it needs to be fortification uh, because resilience is not it. And we also have to have a more uh, robust discussion on realistic um, solutions uh, regarding uh, other land possibilities uh, because we've been doing this since the 1800s and um you know we can we i'm in the library now it's in the historic i've read all the books and so um until we actually get realistic um minded um uh, we're we're doing the same thing um everybody else was doing uh in in the past and the past and the past past um so fortification rather than resilience, because we've heard that before. Okay, well, I don't I don't want to stun the flow of any conversation, but I was just um, thinking about next steps. So it sounds like my, I think, uh, could still work on these two strategies for housing. Um, Gabe, I hear you that you might, you know, you might not be comfortable with the the housing, you know, the strategy about housing being considered in all organization or all uh, decisions, sorry. <laughs> um, but I think we can have Mike draft those and then just consider them um, or consider it when we, when we get to that. Um, if that sounds good, and and Aaron, I kind of hear you saying the same thing that you're not sure you're comfortable with it, but I feel like it's no, worth. I'm not opposed to it. I just think that there there are other things that also are very important, right? So no, I'm I'm all about yeah. like drafting that. And let's take a look at it. Okay, okay, yeah, and I think um, yeah, we can. I think both you and you know Aaron kind of referencing economic development and then Aaron also talking about transportation. So maybe we can think more about how to, you know, if we want to highlight those in the beginning section or how to kind of, um, yeah, focus on those. And then I do, I personally agree with Maria that I think, you know, a resiliency chapter, if Mike is up to, you know, drafting that. And I assume that some of that can come out of the working group that's that's not, I don't think, a formally a city committee, but they must have some, I'm assuming they have some um, action items and that can be kind of crafted into aspirations and goals and strategies um, that we can get some of it from them and not just make it out of whole cloth. Um, and then I feel like, uh, you know, to get to the rest of, given that it's 7.09 now, and I do want to get to reviewing the one set of minutes that we have and also talking about the next public input meetings, um, you know, we're, we're going to have more to review on the housing chapter anyway. So um, maybe we can also, and I will, I will do a better job at reviewing the, the emails um, Maybe we can also get to his specific comments on housing and any of the overarching comments that he made um, that we didn't get to today. 
Uh, Mike, I do have one question, which is, you know, I totally, I think what you said is important that we want the public to feel like we are, you know, we may not be adopting their strategy or their suggestions, but we want to respond to them. Um, I mean, is that something that you, I mean, you've been responding to Peter via email, but like, should we respond to Joe, for example, and just, you know, share what we said about the TIFF stuff or how, how should that process happen? Um, is that your office? Yeah, it can be, there are different ways of, of doing it. Um, just going to grab something really quick to. Let's see if that's one. used to have these all the time. Now I can't find one. Um, keep, keep adjusting it and I don't know why. Oh, just switching it to a separate page. Um, stop doing that. All right, I'm not sure why it's doing it. Um, but I'll just... Share my screen really quick. Uh, there, so there are just different ways of doing it. And this, for some reason, is coming out really terrible. And I don't know why. Um, it's decided it's putting column A over here on the left and then B and C. So in any event, I'm not really sure why it's deciding it wants to do that. But um, what this does, this was how we did the zoning. So everyone had a number. Every time somebody made a public comment, we just added it to another box on the left. And then we made a staff recommendation and then the council and the planning commission made a decision. What's actually in here doesn't really matter. That was a way that we handled all the public comments. And this these went on for pages and pages and pages and pages, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. And it was our way of being able to say, we heard you, we reviewed it. We don't Hi. have to do that. But I'm yeah, just using I mean, that as a little bit of an example of that was how we did it. We could just go through and say, email people back and say, yeah, we, we didn't make the change. We don't technically have to respond to everybody on every comment. I, yeah, no, I know, I know that we don't technically have to, but I think it's a good, to me, it seems like a good practice. And I had forgotten about that matrix. I think if you or your staff is willing to do that, um, I think that's a much better way to kind of keep track of public comment and our response public input in our response and you know have something if somebody's like hey you never responded to my it's like then we could just go and look at the matrix um so if you have the capacity to do that i think that's an awesome process and easier than you know emailing people back and forth to me that seems cleaner yeah because there's something we can then put online and just if people say oh what did you do about my comments like oh well it's in the matrix you can look at yeah. You know, we don't put people's names. We just say, right. here was the comment that we received. Um, and then if people think we didn't have a comment in there, you know, again, there's a lot of things people say that really just aren't comments. They're just people pontificating on, on their thoughts and ideas. But where there's something you can grab onto and say, you know, maybe we should have a policy that says this. Maybe we should have a resilience chapter. Maybe we should have this. Staff recommendation is we should not make any changes to the TIF. Planning Commission decision, we've decided not to change the TIF recommendation. That's yeah. all in there. 
Great. So I'll start to build out a matrix. Um, and I'll, I'll find one that's, I think the issue with that one was for some reason it got itself reformatted in eight and a half by 11. So it broke it into multiple pages where usually it's on an 11 by 17. So it would all fit on a single sheet and it would work better. But for some reason, this new Excel has having some issues. Okay. But I'll build those out and we can add to them. If there's any comments that we think are missed, we can add them in. Um, Great. Yeah, that'd be great for us to have. Um, so I'd like to move on just for the plan for the next chapters and then approve those minutes unless anyone has any last things they wanted to bring up. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the uh, so your suggestion for the next chapters were transportation, energy, utilities, and facilities. And those, are those storyboards all ready to go? Uh, I've reached out to SE Group to start working on them. Most of them, most of the storyboards are all built out. It's just coming up with some final things. Transportation needs like three pictures. Oh, okay. um, so those types of things they're trying to come up with. We're missing one data layer that I just can't find and I got to figure out how we track it down. It was in a plan that we had done. Um, we had done a complete streets plan. So we had all the GIS data layers for it, but our consultant has it and we don't, and I can't seem to get our hold of our consultant who has our data layers. So um, we'll have to figure that one out or my new planner when he shows up is a GIS whiz. So I might, give him a fun project um, to have him work on that, but he won't be here till July 1st. So I'll have to see if we can't figure something out between now and then. But I thought transportation, energy, and utilities and facilities are all kind of related. Um, not all utilities and facilities, obviously sewer and water are not related to energy, but there's a lot of other things that are related. So I just have to give my wife my keys, just a second. Do people have any ideas about whether it should be in person or a Zoom? You know, I'd like to try it online just with the in-person, not having so many people. I just like to see if it brings out a different group of people. I thought we had more people at the Zoom. Yeah, I mean, I think we should... I don't know if we should do two or three meetings because we did three last time, two in person and one Zoom, but I think we should do at least one in person and one Zoom. If, we also, have a, if we also have a table at the farmer's market, maybe we could do one in person and one Zoom and then have the table at the farmer's market. Then that's three, essentially. Yeah. Do we have a like planning commission um, Twitter or like any kind of social media accounts that uh, you know we could kind of or a Facebook account that we can you know, blast to people because we we really are failing um, you know the with the technology that we have available and you know storyboards are cool. Um, we could just do more social media. I'm I'm not a fan of social media or like that, but I mean, uh, it's the it's it's what we have to do. I was born into it. Well, I wasn't even born into it. The younger people were. I but most of us in here uh, weren't born into that. But we, we should, forward facing and future planning commission people probably would um, would like to have it already probably implemented now. We're just kind of missing that boat. So I'm just suggesting maybe we could do that. And then that way we could be more dynamic and saying, hey, uh, eyeballs here. Yeah, so we don't. The city does have a number of accounts, and that's what Evelyn does. And so she's been trying to um, try, trying to put stuff out on those. And we have heard some people have been getting out, but it obviously isn't getting out enough to everybody um, 
I think we'll, we'll eventually end up having a few more pieces that will start coming together. Um, I think if we got a bridge article or something like that, that it would, um, because it reaches a different group and more people. Um, and again, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going through public input right now and we're just going to hopefully keep building. I'm hoping it's going to be a process of building on, on itself so that by, by the time we get to the fall, we have a lot more people who are tuned in and knowing it's going on. Cause right now we're just trying to connect to people to even let them know this is going on. We're doing the city plan update and hopefully more and more people know it's going on. It's going to go on for the next six months. Um, so what I'm uh, coming yes. to realize, what I'm coming to realize at at fifty is, um, some of my friends are grandparents, um, and uh, and and some of my classmates are grandparents, um, and I'm I would not ever having children and not having uh, been married, uh, some of the things that um, I would have normally learned through just the osmosis of a kid, um, I'm missing. Um, I only say that to say that. Um, you know, we are um, in need of thinking about building a Montpelier for uh, the younger generation. So the bridge is not screaming to me younger generation uh, as far as attention. And the millennials are the next biggest. Um, I'm Gen X and, you know, we, we got Lebowski um, because we were so small. Uh, but the millennials and younger are the biggest uh, populace coming uh, on board. And so their input is going to be more important uh, than, let's say, what we're doing with the historical society, um, just moving forward. I think it's hard to get that generation out to these events uh, for the partially for the reason that you mentioned of being parents, <laughs> uh, that they're just, they're busy <laughs> during the, the time that we do this stuff. Uh, which I think that's is why I mean, that's, but that's what I mean. The social media may help you more. I'm like, give us, tell us how, how can we get to you? <laughs> I mean, I, we talked about this at the last meeting briefly about, you know, using our, our own connections of emails that we have from people in town, um, you know, sending out to the families that I coached their kids in soccer uh parents that we know at school but you know i think the farmer's market is a great opportunity to grab people uh that uh, and a diverse crew as well uh of people who are you know going out there anyways uh and it's at a time you know it's not in the evening when parents have extracurriculars or dinner time or bedtime or something like that um but I mean, even th using the bridge is a good idea too. We need that pop. That's a, we need that segment of the population. Um, I don't know. We just tell your friends, I guess. Right? I everybody I pass in the neighborhood. I hey, I'm I'm new on the planning commission. We've got meetings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they don't. I mean, I think it's good to emphasize too. They don't even have to come to the meetings. I mean, I think they can email Mike with comments. I mean, that's for people that's who a, find the online right. interface too much or, you know, can't come to a meeting, um, take a look at what's online and yeah, yeah, definitely. And email Mike, but yeah, I agree with you. I think it's hard to get, even if we had the most savvy social media team, I, I just think it's hard to get attention to this because there is kind of no, it's not a one single hot button issue. <laughs> Too. We need um, we need a con we, we need a concert and then an art like uh <laughs> auction on Langdon. A city plan <laughs> fest. There's a there, I mean there's there's and the reason why the farmers market works is there's um there's an expression of of meeting people where they are and sometimes that's you know that's physical. It's an actual just find out where people are and you set up in places where you're going to have a lot of people around. And that's why the farmer's market kind of works. Um, of course we, I did the first one. Um, and it was great. We had a lot of conversations, a lot of people who weren't from Montpelier. So they were still very interesting conversations, but, um, people from Vancouver, people from, you know, all over the place. So, but it was good. It was, um, 
you know, we got responses from people that we normally wouldn't get. So it was a good, I thought it was a good um, opportunity. And I think we'll, we'll keep doing them. Um, and I'll let you guys know the next time when we're doing them. So Carlton, if you want to show up and hang out at the table, we can all do that. Um, and I might need some coverage too. So I'll let you guys know. Um, happy to, uh, happy to share the load. And, and some of the reason inside game, uh, why you were seeing Vancouver people is because that school, I believe is, uh, transferring people from the West coast to here. And then people from here out there, uh, cause oh. it was recently bought, uh, bought by a, a particular, um, institution. I'm not sure too much, but you probably saw a lot of West coast people come in because that was, that was the. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very interested in attending the farmers market, and I should be around for a lot of Saturdays. Um, but let's. So, does it make sense? Will we have um, time to get the storyboards together, and will enough planning commissioners be attending if we did, you know, a public input session on our next two meetings, which I think are June 24th and July 8th, and one could be Zoom and one could be in person. Is that Mike? Is that you think we'd be anybody, ready? Yeah, I was just seeing if anybody jumped in to say they were going to be on vacation on those weeks, or uh, I'll I will be generally around. So for new people who don't know, uh, uh, I well, I currently live in Hardwick and I have a small farm, and June is when I put up hay. So every once in a while, it comes up where all of a sudden uh, you make hay when the sun shines. So. If it happens to be that Monday afternoon, I am bailing hay, I will not be at our public input meeting because I just can't. It's not possible. I've got to put up the hay. When What's the almanac say? What's the almanac hay? say? <laughs> What's the almanac say? Uh, <laughs> well, I haven't I... seen the forecast, so but I try right. to usually try to schedule to avoid these things. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Um, so that's that's one piece in my calendar that's kind of crazy. The second piece is, I'm buying a house in Montpelier, so kind of crazy. Uh, I will be a fellow uh, Montpelierite if everything works out. Um, so we'll see how oh. see how that goes. So that's another thing that'll keep me kind of crazy for the next uh, couple of weeks and a couple of months. But uh, I don't think it will affect um, the ability for me to be available for the 24th or the 8th. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. A vote of confidence in your uh, in, in where you work. <laughs> Are you gonna say, Brian? I was gonna say, like, I'm good on the 24th, and I'll be I'll be away that week of July 8th. But that's no reason not to have the thing. That I'm I'm yeah. not a make or I mean, break I, person. I'm one I person. Kind of feel like i mean i don't know what other people's schedules are i'm just gone one week in august but i feel like late july and august i don't know if it's it feels like a lot of people are going to be away um so should we try to bang out these two or bang out i shouldn't say mm. <laughs> should we try to do two more public input sessions or just put it off to the fall i'm not sure given what you said about your no, I would, I like, think it's good. I would rather see us keep moving on getting okay. these done because even if we get these three done, we still have six more to go. Right. Um, so and, I wouldn't want to wait assume, till the fall because then we're into the winter. I assume if, you know, you are, you, you are caught up with hay or moving, but one, I mean, we can still have the meeting. We just wouldn't have your assistance and expertise, but. Yeah, uh, and you guys would have seen my presentations enough to probably be able to go through some of the slides for folks oh, after right. seeing yeah, it should... 10 times. So um, it probably would get pretty uh, easy for you guys if I happen to miss one or um, for any reason. I mean, most planning commissions meet throughout the state without any planning directors. We're a fortunate community uh, that we've got planning folks that staff these meetings. So. Um, so which, um, which one should be in person and where should we have it? Should we do it at the Alps or, um, 
another site or do you want to, is that just something you can work on? And I forget how early we should, I mean, we should start probably, but if we can get the sort of the word out as soon as possible. I kind of like the country club road site, even though I've got to get some better signage to point people to where to get to the back door. Um, so next time we're going to have some push signs because this was, that was the first time I'd been there for a meeting and I hadn't realized just how around back it was. So we're going to try to get some signs, um, made up that'll be usable, not just for this, but for other times. I think, uh, I it's, it's ADA accessible, it's air conditioned. It's, um, I, I, I thought it was a good site, even if we didn't get a lot of people there at that time. So should we aim to do June 24th there or July 8th or does it matter? Um, okay. I feel like, I feel like if okay. we push, I feel like we push it back as far as we can, that'll give us more runway to get the word out. And I think it's probably more important to have the, that notice for the in-person one as opposed to Zoom one. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So let's do July 8th at the Elks and um, and then maybe like Mike, you and I could connect at some point so that I could sort of like be a backup if to like know how to get into the building. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea. Um, all that stuff. And then and I think the 8th would be a safer date for me. It's less likely I'll okay. be. God, I would hope yeah. I've got all the hay in. It's supposed to be in before the end of June. So if, if it's July and I'm still putting up hay, then something has gone tragically wrong. Like last year when I got my June hay up in September because it never stopped raining. So, so could we, uh, could we um, possibly throw up uh, something up on the, on our website saying, or asking the public where they would want it um, as it, um, it seems like we're making decisions for them and that may not be accessible for everybody who lives downtown and the older population um, who may not want to navigate Zoom. So couldn't we just do like a, hey, we're doing this since we have more time baked in uh, to the eighth, um, build that into a larger campaign of getting the word out. By engaging the population in, uh, of Montpelier and saying, hey, you want to have this here be a great opportunity maybe um i don't know what's going on with rebel rouser uh but be a great opportunity to possibly take the paper down there and be like hey you're not doing anything with it let's bring some people in here and write the you know we, if we're going to meet at the um country club for certain things we should do it consistently i i, I appreciate that but it, you know we can move it around as well and, and bake that into the dynamic and the nimble uh of, of what we're trying to uh as we flex that muscle. Yeah. The only requirement is it has to be accessible. So we would have to review the space to make sure it is ADA accessible and not all of the spaces are always end up being ADA accessible. Is Memorial so, Hall, is Memorial Hall accessible? The one up on the college, is that, it, uh, is that a ADA? I think it, I think it is. It might be. Um, Cause that would be a great, since we're doing things in the farmer's market, it'd be a great kind of like focus area uh to bring the community as well farmers market then you have that place and it's just association back and forth uh in a way where it's easier to maintain um uh, you know cognitive um uh you know sustainability on that so um, which which so which make it easy sorry. just make it easy just it's seven thirty three, it e and i really i do need to get off sorry to interrupt but i I don't know if I should cede to Maria if Maria has a few extra minutes, but um, <laughs> we can we can also just, hold the I mean, meeting. This, this is good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we can hold the minutes as well till till the next meeting as well. Okay. That's not a big let's, deal. Let's hold the minutes, and it sounds like we have a plan for a Zoom meeting, public input meeting on those three chapters, June twenty fourth, um, and then July eighth. Maybe we can just put in the announcement, let us know if you have thoughts on where to hold it. And then the Elks could be a backup since the city owns it. Um, so it wouldn't require a lot of coordination. Does that I can, make sense? I can, I can make some calls too. It's not, it, this is not a big okay. deal. Great. Yeah, let, um, yeah, let me know. 
Do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Okay, Carlton makes a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Aye. Okay, thanks everyone. So I'll see thanks, you everyone. on the 24th and Mike, yeah, let's just, we'll just try to connect and make sure that we're all ready for that meeting. Have all right, that. thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Have a great night.